Hello, and welcome to another edition of the United Way Partner Spotlight. Today, we're talking with Eric from the Friendship Center about stalking. How are you today? I'm doing well, Dave. Thank you. How are you? Thank you. Now, why are we talking about it this month? So January is National Stalking Awareness Month. So the Friendship Center, along with a lot of other organizations, are really doing a lot of awareness and education this month. And what, what exactly is stalking? I mean, it's, many of us probably have our own definitions, but what's the right. official? <laughs> Yeah, so many folks think about stalking as kind of a creepy stranger in the bushes type of deal, but stalking really is defined as a pattern of behavior that's mm -hmm. directed at a specific person and that is intended to cause that person fear. Okay. And the thing to remember about stalking is that the vast majority of the time, it's perpetrated by somebody who knows the victim. So more often than not, it's a current or a former romantic partner. Mm -hmm. It can also be an acquaintance or a family member. But more often than not, it's not a stranger. That's that's kind of a myth that's been invented by Hollywood. Okay. And it can even be online, too. I mean, it doesn't yeah. necessarily have to be, you know, yeah. like you said, in the shadows. It could be somebody that's pestering you um, constantly on Facebook or... Right, yeah, that that's part of that pattern of behavior is whether it's an approach in person or a letter or a phone call, text message, email, social media. Um, the increase in the availability and usefulness of technology over the course of the past 10, mm -hmm. 20 years has really um, created a lot of new opportunities to stalk people. Yeah, wow. How many people are affected by stalking? So across the country, um, it's estimated that somewhere between six and seven and a half million people are stalked each year. That's a lot. Um, that is a lot. It's unfortunately probably a vast underestimate as well because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't recognize stalking as a crime and something sure. that they can report. So I think a lot of people don't report stalking behavior to law enforcement where these statistics come from. Which is probably also the myth that it's, that it's primarily women, but, I, but men can be easily, just as easily stalked as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, we see statistics that say um, about one in six women are stalked and one in 17 men are stalked during the course of their life. Um, we do know that men who are the victim of Crimes that are you know, connected to intimate partner relationships tend not to report. So chances sure. are good that that one in 17 is, uh, again, an underestimation. Sure, I, I'm sure there's that, that misconception that you look less manly because you're afraid of a woman. Yep, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yep, and, and men also have different ways of identifying what's scary to them. Mm -hmm. And that's the big key for stalking is it's, it's scary or fearful to that one individual victim. Okay. So it's different for everyone. Now, what types of behavior can be considered stalking? So the old-fashioned um, definition of stalking really depends um, a lot on approaching a victim or surveilling someone from a distance. Um, a lot of times that could look like hiding outside of their house or their workplace or mm -hmm. following their car. Um, GPS is a very popular tool to use to stalk people because it can be kind of hidden in the car or in the purse or something like that. Mm -hmm. With a lot of the new technology in Bluetooth trackers, that's a new means of um, technology facilitated stalking. Um, but could, it could also be things like sending gifts, unwanted gifts to work or to school or, or someplace like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the hard thing about stalking is things that might look very sweet or romantic to outsiders are actually very scary to that stalking victim because it's come from that person that they're fearful of. And that's the, the very um, important thing to remember is that in the context of a relationship, that stalker knows best how to unsettle the victim. So that person can do things specific to the victim that will make that person fear, fear, feel fear, mm -hmm. but that others might not recognize as being scary. So frequently it's not the act itself that, that constitutes the stalking, but the message that's coming behind it and the response that happens. Right, exactly. And that's the thing that people often don't understand is that all of these behaviors in and of themselves might not be crimes. Sending someone a gift is not a crime, but it's part of that pattern of behavior that's meant to make that person feel fear, mm -hmm. and that's what makes it stalking. Now, how can uh, victims of stalking explain to others what's going on? That's the, that's the key piece, is explaining that fear, right? Because we're all scared of different things or different people, mm -hmm. and it's a different situation for every stalking victim. So in order to help friends, family members, um, advocates, or law enforcement to understand what they're feeling and why they're feeling that way, victims really need to bring into context why that person or the people stalking them make them feel fear, usually including context about past relationships or mm -hmm. past relationship violence 
is key to that. Oftentimes in a stalking scenario, there has been an intimate partner relationship and there's been some, forward, some sort of uh, physical or emotional abuse during the course of that relationship. So adding in that context is really helpful. Okay. And why should it be taken seriously? Stalking is a very personal, very invasive crime. Um, it, it doesn't seem very dangerous because it's not a, a physical act of hurting someone, mm -hmm. but it really upsets the lifestyle of the person that's being stalked. Um, often stalking victims are forced to move or to change jobs or to pull their kids out of schools to escape a stalker. Um, oftentimes their family members and friends are confused or upset by the situation and they lose out on those support networks. Um, and often stalking leads to physical sure. violence. Um, more than half of the time in Montana when a, an intimate partner murders their current or former intimate partner, there is some level of stalking beforehand. We've seen that in case reviews. So stalking mm -hmm. really is um, a red flag for lethality or risk. So don't just, you know, blow it off when it's that early stage and it's, it's the, the, the very easy, right. simple stuff, like the gifts being sent and all of that, like you said, mm -hmm. don't, may not necessarily seem on the surface like there's something wrong there, but. Absolutely, and the other thing that we really can all do as a community is stop using the term stalking quite so loosely. You know, in, um, an example could be I was stalking your Facebook photos or something like that, and people say it is kind of a joke. Mm -hmm. um, and stalking, honestly, it's not a joke, it's a crime, and it's very scary for people who experience it. So um, we can all make victims and survivors feel a little bit more comfortable by taking it seriously. Now what should a stalking victim do? So there are different things that will work for every individual. Um, the one thing that I would encourage every stalking victim to do is to contact a local advocate um, in the Lewis and Clark, Broadwater, and Jefferson County area, that is the Friendship Center. We have advocates who are specially yep. trained to work with stalking victims. Um, but some other things that stalking victims might consider is reporting to law enforcement. That's not the right decision for everyone, and we at the Friendship Center fully respect that. Um, and they can also seek civil protection orders, mm -hmm. which is a, a court-issued document that um, expresses the stalker must stay away from the victim. The thing with contacting an advocate is that advocates at the Friendship Center and other places like the Friendship Center can work you through all mm -hmm. that process. Advocates can safety plan with a stalking victim and find out what the behavior is that's happening, what kind of lifestyle change that victim is comfortable with making to reduce the potential for violence, um, help them to petition and get a protection order, okay. and even help them to report to law enforcement if they're comfortable okay. with that. It's good to know that something like the Friendship Center is there too, because I'm sure for a lot of the people, especially when it's this, like we were talking about with you know getting the flowers at work and all, mm -hmm. you probably have individuals that, for right or wrong, may be worried that they won't be taken seriously Absolutely. by law enforcement for complaining about he mm -hmm. sent me flowers. Exactly. But yep. the Friendship Center is, is 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 there and trained, and this is ex exactly what it is that you, that you deal with, and so you yeah. can be in that better position to be able to advise someone. Yeah, and that's why I suggest that contacting an advocate might be the best first step, is because mm -hmm. a lot of times victims come to advocates at the Friendship Center and they're not necessarily sure how to name what's happening for them. Mm -hmm. And the advocates can help them to recognize that pattern of behavior that actually is stalking. And then decisions can be made from there about whether to involve law enforcement or not and how to safety plan around that. Definitely a good first way to go. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some other resources that, um, that are available for people? So the first uh, resource that I would suggest to anybody aside from a local organization would be the Stalking Prevention Awareness and Resource Center. Mm -hmm. It's a national organization that focuses entirely on stalking. So that is the one and only thing that they work on. They don't provide direct services to victims, but they do connect victims with local advocates, and they also do a lot of education and awareness building around stalking. So it's a great resource for victims and survivors, but also for people who work in the fields or are trying to help victims and survivors. Definitely reflects how serious of, of a situation this can be when you've got organizations, even a national organization that was set up just to help absolutely. with this. Yes. So, yes, absolutely. So I think that that should send a message right there mm -hmm. that if you know someone is concerned, 
you know, maybe they're starting to lean that the wonder if is this stalking, is it not stalking? Give the friendship center a call and and sit down with somebody that probably can yep. help them sort that out. Absolutely. And there's a good chance it probably is. If you, th it's, I, I would suspect if it's one of those things. It's like if you're wondering if it is or if it isn't, it probably is. Yeah, uh, whether it's stalking, domestic violence, or sexual violence, we often encourage victims and survivors to really trust their instinct. If they're not feeling safe or if they feel like they're being mistreated, there's a reason they feel that way. And we should explore that a little bit more and figure out what it is that's making them feel that Excellent way. Excellent advice right there. Yeah. What else should we know about stalking? So stalking typically um, is, there's more than one method of mm -hmm. approach that a stalker will use. So they might approach the victim in person or contact that person's family members for information, but then they'll also be using technology to stalk. Mm -hmm. So either hacking Facebook or Instagram accounts or sending emails or using some other um, social media platform or other means of contact online. So there's typically more than one type of approach. Mm -hmm. um, another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of stalkers, especially former or current intimate partners, will threaten or use weapons to commit violence against stalking victims. So that again is a, a reason that this should be taken seriously is because in a significant number of cases, sure. a threat with a weapon is actually made towards that stalking victim. So this can lead to real violence. So bottom line is, is that if, they've got, if you've got thoughts, you're starting to, to wonder, mm -hmm. give the Friendship Center a, a call because yep. it can get bad and it can get bad fast. Yeah, absolutely, and, and another thing that um, I would throw out there as an option is for folks to document incidents mm -hmm. of stalking. Um, that's often part of the safety plan that an advocate would talk about with a victim, um, but it's something that somebody can start doing on their own whenever. You know, if there's this behavior that they recognize as unsettling or uncomfortable, mm -hmm. they can start to write that down. It can either be on a piece of paper or on the phone, or there are apps that are available to do that. Um, and oftentimes that would look like a date and a time mm -hmm. and a description of what happened and a location if applicable. And then if possible, any names or phone numbers of witnesses. Okay. Um, and so what that does over the course of time is it really builds to show this pattern of behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's part of the, the technical definition is a pattern. Right, okay. And so if a victim documents every incident every text message, every phone call, every email, every approach in person, over time, anybody who looks at that will be able to say, wow, that's a lot, right? Yes. This isn't just somebody calling you once in a while, this is an ongoing thing and that's scary. Thank you so much for joining us today, Eric. Thank you for having me. Remember that it's National Stalking Awareness Month. Absolutely. The Friendship Center is the local advocacy organization and for more education and awareness, you can go to stalkingawareness.org. That's okay. the Stalking Prevention Awareness and Resource Center's website, and they have loads of good materials on there. That's awesome. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time for another United Way Partner Spotlight. Goodbye.